Welcome to Friday, guys. Um, let's see, May 15th? I think so, yeah. Check my calendar. Yep, it's May 15th. Okay, um, so this is May 15th's video for Friday, and we're going to continue where we left off before. My paper's falling again, so I have so many. So I ended off with the very end of the part three conclusion for the example proposal and solution that I was doing. And we're going to move into what Gallagher says and what I say, what I agree with him on writing and how writing is so important along with reading. And our focus was that um, schools and people actually kill reading. They actually require it to, to the point where you guys just get fed up with it and you just you just shut down and you stop reading altogether. And my proposal is, along with Gallagher, I should say Gallagher's proposal that I agree with, there we go, that's more accurate, is that what if we required reading for enjoyment? I did it. I did a test and I actually did it. And um, when I was in Wisconsin and I was on the curriculum team, and we did the proposal to the International Reading Association um, and we did our units of study and we proved and our data and our statistics showed that for 11 consecutive years that our students earned 100% in reading scores at middle school level, not at fourth grade. Um, fourth grade did come up after for um, after so many years and they, she started implementing exactly what we were doing in the middle school. And we, meaning not just myself, but I worked as a team and our team actually implemented certain things into our classrooms. And um, because of that, our students scored very high, 100% in three different topics, three different subjects. So, and I use six plus one to writing traits. I use Bloom's Taxonomy. I used Gallagher and I used Atwell. And so when we're finished with all of this, and then I'm going to move into polish your, write, your papers, how to polish them to make them A papers. And everyone knows it's been with me for a while, new learning, um, that what I teach you is statistically backed and from the years of teaching that I've had. And I had 11 years in Wisconsin, but I've been teaching for 23 overall. So saying that, I've got quite a, a big background um, in all different grade areas, grade levels I've taught. I think 12th grade is the only grade I have not taught, um, but 11th grade was advanced English. So it's like 12th grade to beginning college. Okay, saying that, um, you, I move through the polish your writing, and then I'm moving through exactly what to do when you polish your writing and all the first writing drafts and what we've gone over, and we're going to do a nice big blanket of everything we've talked about with Gallagher and how Gallagher is going to help you with that writing and what happens when you apply your writing to um, academics like this. And it travels, not just doesn't stay in academics, like, um, or trade doesn't stay just in trade. I'm sure it blankets across the board. So you can use this in any subject and any course. And as you advance through your educational journey, you're taking with you, um, which I actually put in my summation here, um, all the things that you learned for writing and reading, all the strategies. So when you actually look at all the, there's more, oh my gosh, there's more than 70 standards and substandards and many substandards in reading, writing, and English overall. Same in math. There's tons of them and there's substandards within them. And there's no way you can memorize them. But once you start doing them, once you start having examples to look at, it's in your head and you know what that looks like, which is why the polished writing is here. And this is where my conclusion is going, okay? Some of you read Ray Bradbury, some of you did not, but it was basically about burning books and my advanced English, um, English class for 11th graders did. And we actually did a project, of course, because I'm a project-based teacher. And the project was for the duration of the semester they were with me, which was half a semester. We actually tracked all the um, books that they were burning. We tracked all the books that they banned and we actually made um, the, the chains that you do at Christmas time, paper chains, and we had a color for the banned books. We had a color for burn books. We had a color for schools that were actually not allowing certain books like Dr. Seuss or like the Bears books and different things like that. We actually tracked all that and we had it on paper chains on our ceiling. Our ceiling was 
we, we crisscrossed it. We did, um, and we had the certain colors, so we posted the colors so everyone would know. Our ceiling was full by the time we were done with just that one semester. And the semester was what, September, October, November, December, four months. And in four months' time, they each did their proposal paper, their argument paper on this, on banned books and uh, books that were not allowed or books that were questionable or libraries that actually banned books. And then the books were actually burned and they actually burned them to eliminate them. And then um, you can still see that today in some textbooks where the history books have changed. There are certain things about history that are not in the books which is why research is so pure and valuable and that you understand the message of argument because just because you read something on Facebook does not mean it's true. Just because you read something on the internet, you're going to assume it's true? I hope not because no, do your research and find out where did that information come from. That's where we're going and that's what the data shows. And when individual people, students, and um, young Americans, young adults, even older adults, if they know how to research a topic, um, even uh, presidential races, politically, they do that all the time. Congress does it, senators do it. Um, they try to feed you the truth, they say, but if you don't do your research, you really don't know if it's true or not. You're just taking their word, oh yeah, that it's true, which is not good because people can lie in human development or human purposes, yet they do lie, which is not good. You don't want that at all. Um, you want to work together for the same purpose, the same goal. And when you have that, it's such a great feeling because you feel part of a team, a true team that actually works to the good of human development, of universal human values, which is what learning is supposed to be. That's the bottom line. So I start with Gallagher Part 3 conclusion. Ray Bradbury once said, you don't have to burn books to destroy a culture. And you don't. So that once upon a time, they were burning books and they were banning them, thinking, okay, if we take them away from people, then they can't read them. But really, just get people to stop reading them. If you get people to stop reading, or if you water down the curriculum or water down what's required for reading, or do it so much that the kids hate reading and they will not read, then you've stopped reading. That's part point of Redecide for Gallagher, which I totally believe in. So the traditional um, way of teaching reading does not work. And I grew up the traditional way of um, Sally, you know, um, oh, I forget the name now, I have it in the other room, um, the workbook. But they actually have you circle things and you read the sentence and you pick and you do multiple choice and you write in the answer. And the writing in the answer is not too bad, but when you start filling in the circles, all you're doing, all I remember is filling in a circle. I don't remember the answer I was giving. Okay, if I had to write the word in or write the entire sentence and finish the sentence with specific words, I remembered the information. So again, here's Bloom's taxonomy. You're working at not just a bottom line level where you're just like, I'm just going to fill this circle in here. Oh, that's my answer. Or you're just going to check it and that's your answer. No, when you actually take it, you have to write it yourself and you actually have to give it back to someone, teach someone else it. That is modeling. That is learning. And then people learn at different levels. And this is our learning styles. And everyone that I've met so far has to read it, write it, and say it. And basically, that's their learning style, whether they want to admit it or not. And if they don't do that, they don't get it. They don't learn it, which is a travesty because then you can't teach it to the next generation. And trust me, I want you guys to teach it to the next generation. I'm not going to be here forever. So it's up to you. I'm passing it along to you. I don't want to keep it for myself. Oh, no. I want want you to get it from me and then from there you pass it on to whomever you're going to run into. That's the beauty of learning and that's the beauty of education. That's the bottom line. So saying that, let's um, before our culture goes down the drain, let's change the way we approach reading with our students. Let's give them lots of good books. Let's give them a place to read them and let's give them time to read them now before it's too late. And with that statement that Gallagher made in his conclusion, I completely agree because I gave my students time 45 minutes a day. And some people will argue saying, oh, that's way too much time. No, it's not because I had 100% on my data every year, those major tests at the end of the year, 100% accuracy for my students in reading every year. And that was, uh, it didn't matter if they had support, um, accommodations or whatever, and, and 
It didn't matter. They all received 100%. So it's, it's proven track record. I get, had a place for them to read, section of my room, had a couch and chairs. They sat on the floor. I didn't care as long as they were reading, quality books reading, and they were reading for the 40 minutes that I required. That's what they had to give me. And then I gave them that time, and I gave them good books. And I had shelves brought into my classroom, and every book I could get a hold of, I had people giving me books, and the books were solid. And do my bookshelves look all nice and neat? No, because I had students in there every single day reading. So um, did I... Straighten them up at the end of the day? Sure I did. I straightened them up every single day and every single morning I came in as soon as I would have at least um, 15 to 20 kids coming up to my room before the bell rang and this and there, our bell rang at quarter to eight. 7.30, quarter to 8. So I had to be there at 6.30, quarter to 7. I had students that by 7 a.m., their parents were dropping them off, and they were coming into my classroom because they couldn't stay down in the lobby, so they had to go somewhere. So I had um, a pass for them to come up to my classroom, and they were reading from 7 o'clock a.m. to 8. So they read in addition to the 45 minutes I gave them per day because they were reading a novel they wanted to finish. And then they would write at the same time and they would get up out of the reading section and they would go to the computer section and they would write their resource. Did anybody talk? No. It was complete silence. No one used the restroom excessively. No one had an excuse to do anything else but read and then do their research report. And they knew that, and they knew there was a time limit on it. And all of those individual students now, I'm really happy for them. Majority of them have gone on to college, and those that have gone on to college, they're graduating. And um, yay! And so they're out in the world with all the educational knowledge that we shared together as middle school, and then they went on to high school and, and received straight A's, and now they're graduating college. So it works. The studies and research shows it works. Okay. Gallagher 2011, and I put Gallagher and Gustafson. So Gallagher was 2011, but I'm stating it as 2020 for myself. The more I can model writing, the better your writing gets. So I want to say rarely are your essays or writing going to be five paragraphs exactly. You get five paragraph essays. We want a five paragraph essay. That's an MLA universal standard that they do. So that way they get at least five paragraphs. But could it be less and could it be more? Sure it could. Um, if you stay within that requirement in the real world, you're not going to have, I want a five paragraph essay from your employer. They're going to ask you to do a research. They're going to ask you to do a memo. They're going to ask you to do something else. Do they want this little one word or little biddly sentence for you to send out? No, they don't because they'll get somebody else to do it because you don't know what you're doing. That's what you're telling them. So very rarely are you going to write five paragraphs exactly with 10, 12 sentences in each paragraph. It's unrealistic. It's not a real world, as you know. When you write, the research and argument tells you how long or short your paper will be. Let me read that again. When you write the research you've done and the argument you're writing about, claim, counterclaim, tells you how long or how short your paper will be. So when I get papers that are one page or two paragraphs, have you done the research? Did you argue, like I just walked you through this argument paper, proposal solution. If you follow the proposal solution outline, and I only get two paragraphs, how on earth did you argue correctly? You did not. So therefore, you have an F, and you know that. So the five paragraph essay is a guide, is a suggestion, so that you know you have to follow the details of proposal solution, defend your proposal, correct, that we re that I read to you yesterday. Otherwise, you did not follow the argument outline. And if you don't follow the argument outline, you have a persuasion paper. Now do you see why everyone can write a persuasion paper, but not everyone can write an argument paper? So then I do not like and never will require exactly five paragraphs. Will I require a five paragraph essay? Yes. Will I require a research paper that has five paragraphs, five paragraph essay research paper? Yes. But am I expecting it to be exactly five paragraphs? No. And if that grade is an A, 
then every time you do that research argument paper, it's going to be different because you're adding to the research or you're taking away the research that doesn't work. So one way or another, that paragraph is always going to alter. That's going to change. Let's keep going. As you mature into adults, I want you to take what you learned into your future, and I just said that. The question I have and want to make sure you take into your future is when you write, you think more deeply, which is innovative thinking. And it's often discovered after extensive writing. When you write equals you think more deeply equals innovative thinking equals often discovered after extensive writing. So what does that mean? More practice today, better thinkers for tomorrow. Definitely. So polish your paper. I'm going to polish your paper because this is exactly what we went through. Express and reflect in Gallagher. Inform and explain in all my videos. Evaluate and judge. I went through and gave you examples and modeled this for you. Inquire and explore. I modeled and we went through it. So you have examples now. Look back at my videos. Analyze and interpret. Take a stand. Propose a solution. They're all examples, it's model writing, so you should be good to go. You have an idea exactly what each section is, and these are six sections that you must do in order to propose, take a stand, and, and present a solution, or you're just persuading. You have not argued. All first draft writing, all, that means all or nothing, it's all. Every single person, whether produced by students or by professional writers are lousy writing. And a lot of you guys think that you can just sit down and you can write the first draft and you turn it in and that's why you're not getting the grades you want because you haven't gone through the process. You haven't polished your paper. You haven't done the six plus one writing traits. Stage, stages of process writing. You haven't gone through the ideas organization. You haven't gone through voice. You haven't looked at sentence fluency word choice. You just thrown things together and you don't make sure you didn't plan out each sentence to make sure it's exactly in your voice and do the research and the argument properly. You just threw it and you say, oh, I want my grade. You're not going to have a passing grade. You didn't do any work. All you did is pretty much just copy words on the paper and you didn't plan it out to make sure it flowed or it basically moves from one paragraph to the next and your ideas make sense. You didn't do it. You basically did exactly what Ray, Ray Bradbury said. It's like um, you stopped reading and you don't know how to gather the information and then present it again to someone else so they can read your information. So if you stop reading, you've killed our culture, our society as we know it, and we don't want to do that. To dabble in writing is half the battle. It's like doodling. Like you don't might not be an artist or a drawer of portraits, but if you doodle, you think on paper. That's what you're doing, you're thinking. So if you're thinking, yay, if you're writing their research paper and you're trying your very best to get to argument, great, yay. Take crummy first draft and make it into awesome writing. So your first draft is always crummy. It's always note taking. You know, mine is always note taking. When I started with Sebastian Ideas, you didn't see me put that into formal write and I kept moving forward. So we had a formal write. We didn't take that. I left it in, in note taking. Um, form until I got gathered enough information. I'm waiting for you guys to submit that information. If you never submit it, then it's my book, not our book, which is fine. Move past one and done. This is what I talked about. That's the first draft, one and done. Draft, model, practice, revise, edit into final paper. If you do not do all of that, if you do not do that process, you have not done it. You have a first draft that you're trying to get an A grade for and you haven't done any of this work. And this is work, yeah, and it takes a long time for some depending on your topic, depending on your sources, depending on your argument, depending on where you're writing, but all writing leads to argument. So 
all those modes of writing lead to a final argument somewhere. Just so you know, you've, you've been inundated with description and expository. So I, so I focused on argument because argument is not focused on that much. Or a lot of people really don't know how to argue. They don't know how to write an argument paper. They write, they think they do, and they end up writing a persuasion paper. But now you know the difference. So at least you know the difference between argument and persuasion. DIY. DIY means that you have to do it. I can't do it for you. You have to do it. It's just like um, looking things up in the dictionary. You have to do it. I can't do it for you. Before, during, and after. Another terminology. Beginning, middle, and end. Plot diagram. You start in, on the very beginning, and then you have your rising action. You have your big bang in the middle of it for a novel. You have a falling action. You have your resolution at the end, or do you? Sometimes you don't have a resolution. Sometimes it's going to continue on and on. It depends on the argument. Replace, add, delete, and reorder it. And that's what you do in your papers. When you take your first draft and you're revising everything and reorganizing it until it's final and you keep doing it over and over, which is called radar, replace, add, delete, and reorder is radar, revision till it's right. And even after it's right, can you take a right, an A paper that's absolutely right and make it into another A paper? Yes, you can, because you're always researching and arguing. You're always, you're not settling for what's always there and given, just like 2011, I can add to mine. Because since 2011 to 2020, there's new research that shows, and it supports Gallagher from 2011. It supports everything he did for, I remember 2011. I was like, wow, it's like, this stuff really works. And I back in 2004 to 2011, 2011, it was like, um, oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. It was like, I'm in the middle of this research activity that actually works. And I have data to prove that this works across the board. So, which is awesome. First draft. Oh, use one line delete to see your mistakes. I always taught you that. If you make a mistake or something, then you're going to one line, because I still want to see what I wrote. Okay. First draft of the body is model, model, model. Revised draft of the body, body, you still look at models. Look at models of other authors, of other people, professional or other students. See how they've written. Um, propo proposal. Editing equals proofreading eyes. And that brings up our glasses. Here we go. Proofreading glass, our proofreading glasses, which is why I got these, so that you know you have to fine tune your paper. Look specifically for mistakes. Look at the details that you might not be able to see anywhere else, at any time anywhere else, and that's what you're looking for. Powerful editing. I don't know if you can see them. Or excuse me, checklist chart you make to track your writing and student writing portfolio. If you keep a student writing portfolio. And some of you might say, well, how do I do that? I don't know what that looks like. You got your mess. Which takes me into this which is perfect. So sentence of the week checklist. Sentence of the week is what I just talked about in the other one. And please place the check next to the skills that can be found in your portfolio. And so I have my students actually create this. So again, this is what you're creating. Anytime you see this like pulled out, that's what I have my students create in their, um, either their notebooks like this, notebook like that, or um, in the spiral. I don't think I have a spiral handy here. Sorry, I don't. I've used all my spirals. I keep using them. Um, but I actually have them put them in there so that they can always refer to them, which is perfect. So this is how you use this checklist. This is the check. You're going to put the check. Here's the page number, if there's a page number or a paragraph line. This is what you're actually doing on that page of your writing. And then this is the checklist and the page number for this section. So actually you're dividing this and this is for here and then this is for here. Pay attention to language because the rules of this language equals higher scores. So the bottom line is um, grammar was boring in school, I'm sure, but there's so many rules. But when you pay attention to the rules of language, 
That means your sentences and your words are going to matter. How you place your punctuation in your sentence matters, which is why I'm doing Grammar Caught You well, for the bell ringer when you first come on and do for attendance um, for a grade because language matters. And a lot of you didn't pay attention to it or you didn't get good grades in um, grammar for the commas and for the semicolons, for the capitals. You guys know the basics, but some of you need that review. I need a review. It's like, I don't remember all that stuff. I have to look up in a right source book. I have to look up in a grammar book. Where is this comma supposed to go? Or does it go in front of the and? Does it go, do I use a or and? What's the rule of a or and again? Um, I have to review that all the time. So I'm not the only one. I know the capitals pretty much stick, you know, if you have a capital because the name place or thing, um, person place or thing. So you have, you're okay. So you're going to place, number one, place a check next to the skills that can be found in your portfolio. And if you don't have a portfolio, writing portfolio, start keeping one because actually all the writing that you do um, you can go ahead and put a check mark. Did you look in your writing and in your sentences for specific grammar items? And this is what I use for my reading and grammar. And I'll go through it because then eventually where I'm going after Atwell is I'm going into reading strategies and I'm going into what I teach my kids on a daily basis. You know, here's a sentence. Are you looking for fanboy sentence? Do you know what that is? Do you look for a awawas? Um, sentence, um, things of that nature too. So I put those in there as well because that's what Gallagher did and I agree with him. Write the page number where the skill can be found in your portfolio or in your paper. Um, and your portfolio should have page numbers. should have page numbers like you're keeping track of everything in the portfolio. Like here's one of mine and I have page numbers in here and stuff. But I also... Um, I have page numbers inside too. So I keep track of what I'm doing for my writing and for anything else that I'm doing for teaching. Um, highlight and number each of the skills in your portfolio. And basically that's what I do here. I do tabs in mine here of past work that I've done. Like here, this is like a newsletter that I did when I was teaching elementary school. And then I can go back and I can actually access, access that and pull that up and actually see it. Well, you're going to do the same thing. And I have another whole notebook full of grammar, uh, full of reading strategies, full of all of this, so that way I can go back and I can see each sentence individually. Pay attention to language, the rules of this language, higher scores. That's your tape. So tape is not only just the reading, it's how are you writing your sentences how are, do you know where that comma goes? Are you using transition words correctly? Do you know the difference between a semicolon and a comma and a, and a, a colon? Um, do you know when to capitalize and when not to? Do you know that a book title no longer has quotes in it, but it should be italicized? Um, and I don't know if the tape is, is asking you for the quotes or the tape, or the itali it should be italicized. So you're using the slant instead of putting it in quotations. Quotations was the old way. Okay. Leads me to writing workshop, Lessons That Change Writers. And I have Atwell's book on this. And I go from Gallagher to Atwell because Lessons That Change Writers are focusing on each and every sentence that you're writing. It's focusing on the language that you have to use. And how do you... Present that language to get your higher scores. So this is the reason why I'm, I'm basically transitioning because she teaches about conditions of a writing workshop. This is what I made and required in my classes, and I hope you adapt the same thing, the same information, is that because you polish the and publish your paper, you get it, and then you double check yourself and you check these items off to make sure that you've done them in your writing. And then lessons that change writers, it changes the way you think. It changes that I have to focus on certain things in my sentences and in my writing. This is me, Gustafson. I have proven and supported these authors and teachers over the years of teaching equals Gallagher and Atwell used in my classrooms equals 100% reading success in all students. Yes, I have the data. I still have the data here somewhere. I, I, I packed it away, um, but the data proves that that is true. Therefore, I will pass my success on to my students to teach those in future generations, not for money, no, for the value of learning for knowledge, 
for thinking about thinking, which is metacognition. Pass it on. Metacognition should be taught to everyone. It's not about the paycheck. It's not about, um, oh, pat me on the back because I have this or this information is great. No, it's thinking about thinking or metacognition. So conditions of writing workshop is predictable structure, structure, mini lessons, which are usually 5 to 20, 25 minutes, never 30 minutes. Um, it's independent um, writing, peer con conferring, and group meeting and follow-up. Your regular scheduled times are three to five schedules per week. So this is kind of like a mini lesson extended. Uh, I'm past my time, so you guys enjoy, and I'll see you guys on Monday. Okay, and this is where we're going to start then. Yay!